Welcome back. In this module we're going to learn about OEE, Overall Equipment Effectiveness. This is a very manufacturing specific tool, but don't worry if you're not from that environment, it is still very useful to understand. It can be applied to processes and people, and is now called something called OPE, Overall Process Effectiveness, so the principles remain very valid. It is also something that many companies in manufacturing use as a metric, as a KPI to measure their performance, so it is important to understand. I hope you enjoy the module. OEE stands for Overall Equipment Effectiveness. In simple terms, OEE is the number of good products produced divided by the theoretical maximum number of products produced. OEE is a measure of how well equipment is utilised in relation to its full potential. The reality is, machines are not always running perfectly, and they have losses along the way. Perhaps they slow down, they occasionally break down, or they produce defective parts. All of these losses make up the OEE value. If we imagine a bottling line, in an ideal world we would have it running with zero problems, zero unplanned downtime, zero slowdowns and zero defects. In reality, we have availability losses associated with breakdowns. We have slowdowns which affect the performance of the machine. And we have quality problems when defective products are produced. OEE aims to quantify these three different types of output loss so that improvement initiatives can be launched to increase the OEE value and therefore the effectiveness of our machines. Before I go on to explain how to calculate OEE, there first must be a need for calculating OEE. OEE is a meta tool in the sense that it doesn't generate an improvement itself, but helps identify areas for improvement, much like value stream mapping or spaghetti diagrams. OEE should be calculated for the specific reason to help identify improvements to a machine's output and efficiency. But before calculating OEE, you should ask yourself the question, why do I want to increase the output and efficiency of this machine? And what will be the impact on the system as a whole? The main purpose and objective of measuring the OEE is to make constraint or bottleneck equipment run more effectively. If you increase the effectiveness of a non-bottleneck process, it will result in no impact on the system's output as a whole. Let's look at an example of this. Bottlenecks are the processes that define the maximum speed and therefore output of a system. If you think of the word bottleneck, it is exactly that, the thinnest part of the bottle that dictates the rate at which the containing liquid can be poured. Bottlenecks within manufacturing environments can often be spotted a mile away by simply comparing processes to see which has the biggest queue of products in front of it. This will signify a process that is slower than the rest and therefore the bottleneck process. In the same way that when you turn a bottle upside down, the liquid will congregate at the start of the bottleneck. In this example, the machine with the biggest build up of stock is the bottleneck. If we compare the cycle times of each process, the cycle time being the net production time divided by the number of quality parts produced, the machine with the highest cycle time is the bottleneck. Process C has a cycle time of 20 seconds, which equates to an output rate of 3 per minute or 180 units per hour. If we then work out the output of all other machines, we can see they vary significantly. Because process C is the bottleneck process, it dictates the capacity of the system as a whole. As the products need to flow through each process, the system is limited by its slowest machine. The capacity of the system is therefore 180 units per hour. Although other machines are capable of producing a much greater output, machine C limits the number of products that can be produced. The reason I want to stress this point is before diving in and calculating the OEE of a machine, or multiple machines, you should make sure that you are measuring it on the bottleneck process. Otherwise, time and effort could be wasted and significant results would not be achieved. OK, so now we are aware of where OEE should be measured and its main purpose Let's look more into how it's calculated. OEE can be calculated in two different ways, the simple way and the more complex but also valuable way. 
The simple way is to compare the number of right first time products produced with the theoretical maximum number of products produced. For example, in a given shift of 8 hours or 480 minutes, in a perfect world a machine would be capable of producing 960 parts, that's one every 30 seconds. If due to breakdowns, changeovers and slowdowns, it can only produce 800 parts, out of the 800, 32 are defective, then the machine has produced only 768 right first time products, out of a potential 960. Its OEE is therefore 768 divided by 960, which equals 0.8 or 80%. That is the simple, easy way to calculate OEE. I would really recommend always doing this simple calculation first, then following it up with the more detailed approach after. That way, you can confirm afterwards that they both match and that mistake hasn't been made. The limitations with this simple approach for measuring OEE is that it doesn't provide us with much information apart from an N number. So out of the 80% overall equipment effectiveness, as detectives looking to improve processes and remove waste, we should be asking, what about the 20% left over? Where has it gone and how can we reduce it and improve the OEE? That is where the more detailed calculation comes in. The detailed calculation splits the OEE into three distinct categories, availability, performance and quality. The three categories are then multiplied together to get the OEE value. The first thing to measure is availability. Availability shows the amount of time a machine is available compared to its potential operating time. For example, if a shift is 8 hours long, which equates to 480 minutes, and the machine is only operational for 360 minutes, due to machine downtime by stoppages, changeovers, or any other reason that causes the machine to stop, then the availability is actual runtime divided by the potential operating time, which is 360 divided by 480, which equates to 0.75 or 75%. Now that we have taken into account times where the machine has stopped, we now need to account for the times the machine is not running at full speed. This is the performance rate. There are many reasons for a machine not running at full speed. Through wear and tear they may start to slow down, micro stoppages or temporary jams might cause equipment to briefly stop, or perhaps input material has a temporary shortage and the machine has to stop or cycle without a part. In reality, it is not practical to measure all of these micro stoppages of the machine. For example, throughout a shift a machine may have thousands of half second stoppages, this cannot practically be measured. So the best way to calculate performance is to compare the outputs. How many products were produced compared to the available runtime? For example, if 1000 parts were produced and the cycle time of the machine is 20 seconds, then there was a total of 20,000 seconds of productive time. By dividing this by the available time in the same units, all slowdowns are taken into account. For example, the available time is 360 minutes times by 60, which gives us 21,600 seconds, and productive time was 20,000 seconds. So 20,000 divided by 21,600 equals 0.926, or 92.6%. That is the performance rate. Just a quick point to note here, even if they're defective products, they should still be included within the productive time. So now that we've taken into account any availability losses and any performance losses, we now need to take into account the quality losses. Quality rate is the number of right first time parts divided by all the parts produced. For example, if 55 out of 1000 pieces are defective, that would leave 945 being right first time out of 1000, which equates to 94.5%. So now that all the elements of OEE have been calculated, you just need to multiply them together. By multiplying all the values together, you get the OEE value of 0.66 or 66%. This can now be compared with the simple calculation 
which would show that 945 right first time products were produced, out of a theoretical maximum of 480 minutes times by 60 seconds to get the seconds value, divided by the cycle time which is 20 seconds, which equals 1440 products if everything was working perfectly. So now, 945 divided by 1440 equals 66%, confirming that both calculations match and OEE is correct. So what does this 66% mean? Well, it means that the equipment is producing 66% of its maximum potential. In other words, it has 34% loss that can be broken down into three loss categories, availability, performance and quality. These act as clues and evidence to help improve the effectiveness of the equipment, as we can now target the number that is the smallest. As we can see, the availability loss was the greatest of the three, suggesting that improvement should be primarily focused around there. We can now explore more into the reasons why the availability value was low. Perhaps on inspection, we find that it's due to long changeover times, in which case we can start using targeted tools like SMED, which are designed to reduce this change over time. This will be covered in the SMED module in much more detail. This relationship between identifying problems and selecting tools will be repeated throughout the course. You first identify the problem using a meta tool like value stream mapping, or in this case, OEE, to uncover the problem, in this case again being long changeovers. You then select the improvement tool with its specific function, never the other way around. With the aim to reduce confusion, I would like to point something else out about the availability calculation. Different companies and people calculate OEE in slightly different ways. I will first explain how others calculate OEE, and then explain why I believe the way we are teaching you is the best way. Some OEE calculations will exclude planned stoppages like breaks and changeovers from the potential operating time as they will say there is no point including them as they have already been planned and accounted for in producing the daily output. You need to be careful here, as this hides part of the evidence we are trying to uncover with OEE. We strongly believe that any planned stoppages should not be deducted from the potential operating time, as it then hides potential for improvement. For example, if a 30 minute break is deducted from the potential operating time, making OEE 360 divided by 450 instead, which equals 80%, then the potential improvement to increase OEE can be missed as they become invisible in the availability value. For example, shift patterns could be staggered to cover break times and prevent equipment downtime, thus maximising machine output. At the same time, as in the name OEE, it is about machine effectiveness and just keeping it running longer isn't necessarily effective. If you decide that planned stoppages should be excluded from the potential operating time, then please restrict them to break times only. Do not include changeover or planned maintenance, as that will mask any improvement potential. If you decide a weekly planned maintenance routine should be conducted on a machine, that should be visible and not hidden within your OEE calculation. Later on, when looking at ways to increase OEE, you can still decide that the plan maintenance should continue as its related downtime is part of the maintenance strategy. There is no definitive right or wrong in terms of calculating OEE, but we believe the more you make visible, the more you can control and therefore improve. There is no harm with having a lower OEE value. It's about increasing the value, not looking at it as a static picture in time. A decision may be made that staggering break times or covering machine over break times is not possible, but it's still worth making this option visible. This leads me nicely onto my next point, and this is a word of caution. Managers, departmental leads, and sometimes operators are measured based on their OEE value. They may receive performance related pay or bonuses directly related to an OEE figure. With these sort of incentives comes manipulation, whether intentional or not. As with everything lean, tools are there to help make problems visible with the aim to help drive waste and maximize customer value. If you can't see a problem, you can't fix the problem. I've seen mediocre companies claiming to operate with a bizarre 110% OEE 
and I've also seen extremely capable and world-class companies proud of an OE of 75% that has improved year on year. Straight away, you can see the difference in culture and mindset between the two companies. There are countless ways to fudge OEE figures in order to inflate them, but the most common ways involve excluding any stoppages, changeovers or breaks from the availability figure by saying that they are planned, they should not be included. Some companies may say this is how they've always measured it, so if they change it now it will go down. To that I would respond by saying yes it would go down, which would be a good thing as it helps identify potential improvement. A true lean leader would be more interested in improvement than they would be on bragging about a high OE value. Finally, before we summarise what we have learnt in this module, we'll briefly talk about using OEE as a benchmarking value. Companies love to compare themselves to best-in-class competition, or even internally between different departments within the same company. To this, I would say that if done correctly, it can be a great way to share best practices and learn from each other. But I would say, stay clear from comparing OEEs between different machinery or using different calculation methods. Different equipment has different requirements and outputs and therefore will vary in OEE. There is no point comparing one process with another one unless they are working in parallel and are the same type of equipment. OEE can be measured for each machine if you want to track improvements in reliability and equipment effectiveness. But if that's your sole intention, then reliability stats like mean time between failure and mean time to failure would probably be more suitable. As we said at the start of the module, bottleneck processes dictate the output of your system as a whole. Regardless of your environment, whether it's bits of information in a computer or loaves of bread through a factory, your slowest machine dictates the speed of your entire system. If you need to increase a machine's output to keep up with tack time, as perhaps demand has increased, then calculating the OEE of a machine is a brilliant starting point helping point you in the right direction to select the appropriate improvement tool to increase the equipment's output. So let's recap what we've learned. OEE stands for Overall Equipment Effectiveness. It can be calculated in two different ways, the simple way and the more complex, detailed way that's also a lot more valuable. In that sense, it's availability times by performance times by quality. OEE is again a meta tool. It does not itself drive an improvement, but helps understand where the improvements can be made. It can be followed up with a tool like TPM, Total Productive Maintenance, which we'll be covering in the next module. OEE should be applied on bottleneck processes as a priority, as that's where it has the greatest impact on your system as a whole. Finally, a point to add is OEE values can be fudged or artificially inflated to make departments or people appear to be in more control of their process. This is something you want to watch out for. You need to understand exactly how it's calculated and you want to celebrate continuous improvements in OEE values, not just static pictures in time. So join us in the next module where we'll learn about TPM, a really powerful tool that actually helps increase OEE and targets the area with the biggest impact.